often think about big data as this proper noun, capital B, big, and capital D, data, when in fact it's really just an adjective, big, describing something, data, that's been around since the dawn of time. You've heard from experts all morning. You've heard about robotics and 3D printing, uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence. And to put it in context, I think we can think of these as inputs and, and think of them as outputs. So, excuse me, robotics, 3D printing, these are creators of data. These are things that are creating data that's making the data, quote, big. On the other hand, you have machine learning and artificial intelligence. These are the logical extensions of having all the data. Now that we have the data, how can we get one step closer to intelligence? Just quickly, think of this first wave of data as the rise of Oracle, relational databases, structured data. Second wave, roughly advent of Hadoop, distributed systems, the ability to store unstructured data. Today, we're constantly bombarded with the idea of data. Everyone has statistics on what happens in an internet minute, et cetera. Now, the one thing I will highlight in manufacturing, this is generally true for all industries, but for manufacturing in specifically, the data historian has been collecting large-scale time series data for many decades, much longer than Pinterest and Twitter have been collecting favorites and collecting likes. So that was all a step back, looking at the past. Looking into the future, everything is up and to the right. Take sensors, for example. In addition to all of the devices, things that have already been connected to the internet. Gartner expects that every single day, 5.5 million additional devices and, quote, things will be connected to the internet. Likewise, platforms. We had the rise of PCs, followed by the internet, followed by social networks, and most recently, smartphones. In the same amount of time, the adoption of smartphones was 10 times that of PCs. Lastly, we all know what happens in an internet minute. Number of tweets, number of YouTube videos downloaded, number of emails sent. What's more interesting in this context, and especially as an enterprise investor, is what's the amount of data that's streaming off an airplane, off other industrial systems, off wind turbines, et cetera. So in the old world, we would all agree that Fiat, Chrysler, Honda, these are all asset-intensive businesses. Fast forward, Uber. Uber owns zero vehicles, and they command a supposed private value of 50 billion. I heard Peter mention 67 billion, so maybe my data is a little out of date. Uh, Fiat and Honda are real asset intensive. Uber is data as an asset intensive. And I'm trying to impart to you that data can no longer be ignored. Uber is the classic canonical textbook case of network effects. As the number of drivers rise, the number of participants rise on the platform, a number of things happen. Drivers don't wait as long between rides. Passengers don't wait as long to hail a cab or the, today's equivalent of a cab. Pr prices are optimized, bad actors are weeded out, and as a result, you reach this natural equ equilibrium between supply and demand. And this is going to be true across markets for, for Uber. Secondly, Uber, canonical case of moving to a service model. Instead of selling you the car, Uber sells you a ride in said car. And as a result, they're able to really effectively match the value generated with the value received on the other end. Now, Uber is not doing this for the good and for the love of passengers and drivers. As a result, Uber is collecting this superset of data. Every single ride, Uber collects a little bit more data by the second, and as a result, they're able to finely tune their models, they're better able to improve all the things I just mentioned, better improve prices, better optimize for supply and demand. Uber ends up with a computational, computational advantage. It is my belief that the winner in this space will be the one with the most data, the reason being that, yield man that ride sharing is a very complex yield management equation, and it's one that's dynamic and always changing. There's nothing static about it. Another great example. Nokia, we all think of it as a hardware company. Classic competitive strategic advantages, they had scope, they had great supply chain R&D, and beat R&D budgets, etc. Apple had less than 10% market share, and they had something that hadn't yet been recognized, and that was a platform. As you can see here, the value of Apple is not the hardware alone. The value of Apple is the combination of the hardware, which we all know in this room is very hard. You take raw materials, supply chain, it's very complex. In addition, the differentiated software. 
The Apple App Store brings together producers and consumers in a very high value exchange, of which Apple takes a cut of each and every one of those transactions. Unlike many hardware products where you buy it once, you never interact with the, the um, producer again, with Apple, it's very likely that all of us in this room continue to interact with Apple. We may buy music, we may, may rent movies, subscribe to Apple Music. These are all marginal cost, near zero, and Apple is able to drive a lot of this premium. The iPhone, in total to date, has generated more than $600 billion in revenue, arguably one of the, the most successful products ever. So, in case this morning wasn't enough, in case you didn't see enough charts up and to the right, data volumes are increasing, they're accelerating, and it's only going to get worse. The, the only thing to note here, and I'll touch on this in, in, toward the end, is on the right, data volumes, it is expected that by 2020, almost 10%, maybe more, of data will be generated at the edge. And again, I'll touch on this toward the end. So you can think of the, the earlier thoughts as the problem statement. We are drowning in data. And it's this perfect storm of, of factors. So take cloud, for example. It was mentioned earlier, Amazon Web Services. A developer can spin up compute and storage in a man matter of seconds. And someone claimed earlier, you can build a company with less than $5,000. Connectivity, sensors, uh, let's see, uh, battery life, and all things are miniaturizing. So you're able, you saw the Raspberry Pi earlier, you're able to put sensors into more and more things. Lastly, data silos, creating all of this data, but unfortunately plant to plant and office to office, creating this perfect storm of all of this data, but what the heck do we do with it? As a result, we have this fallacy that more information is going to give us more intelligence. More money we spend on software startups in San Francisco are going to all of a sudden bring us insights. Unfortunately, I wish I could tell you that was the case. Not the case. And you've heard this morning, automation has been around in manufacturing for many years. However, I think there are more cases where automation can truly be harnessed. So machine learning, you heard the guys talk about it earlier today. I'm not going to give you yet another definition of what machine learning is. What I am going to say is I think all too often machine learning is meant to be overly complex and thus unapproachable. Yes, there are cases like Google search algorithms, which I wouldn't begin to think that I could understand what's going on in those algorithms. That said, in the general case, machine learning is trying to take the burden from humans to machines to do the advanced computation, the experimentation, and the model training without constant oversight from humans. Really, truly, it's the scientific method, method on steroids. Again, mentioned earlier, Every company is starting to move in the direction of becoming a software company. JP Morgan, rumored to have employ more software engineers than Google, which is hard to fathom. Jamie Dimon is very outspoken in his, his search to becoming a software company and use, utilizing more and more algorithms. Likewise, Capital One, we think of their products as being credit cards. Their CIO is quoted as thinking that his products are software and data. Now, I know what's going through all of your heads right now. Disrupting commerce, way easier. Disrupting manufacturing, turns out, really hard. You can't replace an airplane with software. You can make a better airplane, you can do so faster, you can do so differently, but you can't, in fact, replace, you can replace algorithms in trading with better software. You can't replace an airplane with software. Turns out Honda and Fiat still have to sell cars to Uber for Uber then to drive us around as passengers. In the autonomous car case, we still need the cars Drivers may be optional, but we still will need the cars to, to get around. Likewise, American Airlines has to buy airplanes. They may be able to better service those airplanes. They may be able to predict maintenance better with the use of data, but they still have to deliver those airplanes. So it brings me to two things. You can really think of the way machine learning is going to impact the industry in, in two different ways. First is the way of improving the process of making things. The second, improving the actual products themselves. So on the first, automating the process. Rio Tinto was mentioned earlier today, mining giant in Australia. They use autonomous trucks to transport iron ore. That is improving their process. Granted, it's in the natural, natural resources sector, not manufacturing, but same idea. Amazon, right now on their warehouse floor, Machines, robots are running around, putting packages together to deliver the end product to our doorstep more quickly, more effectively. On the second piece, improving the product, think about how software 
has played into the rise of Tesla. Tesla, instead of delivering you a car, you driving off and never improving the car again, Tesla can just update a few code snippets, push it to the car, and all of you have an improved car over the air with, uh, with no visit back to the dealer. So predictive maintenance is a far cry from this dawn of singularity. I accept that. As a venture capitalist, I am in the business of trying to find these ideas, great ideas, which is becoming harder as more and more ideas are coming out, uh, investing into those ideas, and then ultimately selling them back to all of you to consume in your business. Venture as an industry probably hasn't had the best nose for manufacturing like maybe it has for retail, e-commerce, financial services, healthcare. And there are probably many reasons for that. I think one is if you take LinkedIn, take Salesforce. These are companies that skew towards having a massive number of customers, available customers, and the, need, the, the average selling price, price ends up being much lower. Contrast that with manufacturing, much narrower available customer set, and often the sell, selling prices are million or multi-million dollars. Now, this is just a different risk appetite for venture capital. I don't think that it doesn't mean that it, it doesn't exist, but it is changing. So you guys, you guys know this better than I do, in fact. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this, but the, this illustration is focused on the former point, automating the process of manufacturing as opposed to automating the end product. You're seeing design creation modeling. This is tightening up. This is moving to a virtual world. With the help of digital, the, the iteration cycle is happening faster. Uh, value chain, supply chain, you guys have, have heard plenty about this, and as pointed out earlier, lots of venture capital money is flowing into this space. Decommission, service, recycling. I'm from San Francisco. A visit to the San Francisco recy recycling plant is actually a sight to behold. Humans working alongside machines, conveyor belts going every which direction, robotic arms trying to pull off the big cardboard boxes, etc. There is a lot of innovation happening in this space. What's most interesting, we have all the use cases. There are many more than represented right here. But in fact, there are so many brains applying themselves to coming up with companies in the space and trying to take these use cases, make them optional, operational, and deliver them to all, to, to all of you. I'll hi highlight a few. Mana, for example, just raised $26 million last week from a, a combination of some extremely good corporate VCs focused on creating an enterprise knowledge graph and focused exclusively on manufacturing and natural resources. Sight Machine, canonical example in manufacturing. Lots of you probably know the company. Again, West Coast based. They're trying to create a data hub collecting data from sensors, from databases, from plant equipment, from every which direction, system of record, and trying to analyze all of it and you know, create insights. That's, uh, that's everybody's goal. Falconry, claiming to do artificial intelligence with, with sensors specifically. Time series data is an inc incredibly hard compute problem, mathematics problem, and they're trying to tackle it from the sensor side. I could go into examples. You guys know many of these. I mean, as we move from mass production to batch size of one, I can now get, I'm a runner, I could get my name etched onto my Nike shoes, and they're creating that just for me, for CAC specifically. Montclair. They make expensive puffy coats in the East, in, not the East Coast, we're on the East Coast, um, in Europe. And they're embedding sensors, unique identifiable sensors, into every coat with the, the abject goal of reducing uh, counterfeit goods. There, there's the good and the bad. In this case, as things become more and more connected, we're going to have more target cases, HVAC units being um, infiltrated. There was a dam in New York a number of years ago that was infiltrated. So we have to be wary of this. Now, cyber physical systems, you guys can tweet at me later, I'd be curious, but as I see it, there may not yet be examples in the most glorified sense of cyber physical systems in practice. Again, correct me if I'm wrong, I welcome, I welcome feedback. So with just a few more minutes, I wouldn't be doing my job as a venture capitalist if I didn't impart to you what I, where I thought the world was headed. So I'll take these in turn. They're in no particular order. But firstly, compute must move to the edge for technology to disappear. We can no longer have this tethered piece to the cloud brain whereby 
all of the intelligence is happening in the cloud or bandwidth and connectivity are going to be overwhelmed. You're seeing early signs of this. Google open source TensorFlow and turns out that you can, in fact, run small, small scale examples of TensorFlow on a mobile phone. Secondly, 3D printing. Now, I should put a big asterisk on this. I am making no claims about consumer 3D printing, manufacturing little personalized jewelry and Legos. I'm exclusively talking about 3D printing in the, case, in the case of manufacturing. For discrete parts and complex par products, especially as the design cycle iteration, utilizing 3D printing to get um, to modeling out the door more quickly. Lastly, we actually haven't heard a lot of this this morning, which I thought we might hear more of, but drones and augmented reality. Now, I deliberately excluded virtual reality, as I don't think, I think virtual reality will be a much more of a consumer and much more of an entertainment-focused use case. That said, we're due for a platform shift. Smartphones was really the last platform that emerged, and that was in 2007, 2008. Historically, it's been every seven or eight years. Do the math, we're due for something. Uh, in manufacturing specifically, I think drones and augmented reality have a place, and it'll remain, it remains to be seen what will happen. So I'll leave you with two more thoughts. The first should be good news. This was true when I joined Cloudera in 2010, and it's true today. More data will always beat better algorithms. In your case, with the data historian, you guys have been co collecting large-scale time series data for much, much longer, as I said, than Twitter and Pinterest have been collecting their clickstream data. This should be good news. Lastly, the reason we're here is because the pace of innovation is changing, and it's changing rap rapidly. This is empirical, and this is known. If you haven't come away from the morning picking that up, then we failed. But what remains is the pace of adoption. It's up to all of you, to each individual enterprise, each individual manufacturing company, each business unit, each business leader, to determine how and where you're going to utilize this data to generate a competitive advantage and seize the day. So with that, you're welcome to tweet at me, CACF, and um, shoot me an email if you have, if you have comments. Thank you. Thank you.